people sometimes tell me, and it may be more prevalent in uh, certain types of churches, I'm not sure, but people, some people say to me that faith is private. That faith is something you keep to yourself, it's not something you spread around and share around, it's between you and God and nobody else. I'm going to say something quite hard, if that's what you think, then Satan is talking, not God. Please don't take that personally, it is something you need to deal with. When, uh, when Peter told Jesus certain things about how Jesus was going to act, Jesus told him to get behind him, Satan. Jesus was very clear, and I think we need to be clear. Not one part of scripture would give us any idea that faith is private. If you really know the fear of the Lord, then you will take every opportunity to share what you have discovered in Christ. Only Satan would say otherwise. Only Satan would convince us that faith is private and not to be shared. Let me show you 2 Corinthians 5.14. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Christ's love compels us to speak, to share. It's a funny way to put it actually, because normally what we would say is that we should love people enough, that we should love people enough, that we will tell them about Christ. But Paul's saying, in actual fact, we need to twist our logic around because it's Christ's love, not my love, that compels us. It's Christ's love, convinced as we are, that God sent his Son to die on the cross and rise again in victory over sin and death. Convinced as we are that God has proven his love for us, that Christ died out of love for all people, what is stopping us from telling people? Well, I know the answer. It's all right. I'm sure you know the answer too. It's fear, mostly. It's easy to fear men and women. It's easy to treat the judgment day as though it's a long way off. And, well, it just sometimes doesn't feel all that real, does it? We, it's not that we don't believe it's not coming. We just, it's somewhere out there. It's easy to live peaceful lives with the people around us and hope maybe that someone else will tell them the hard facts. It's easier to say that the opportunity hasn't presented itself or that another one will come up or that God will sort them out or there'll be another time or another day. But mostly, we fear hurting people's feelings. We fear the confrontation. We fear being ridiculed. We fear being seen as judgmental or intolerant, maybe particularly when we talk to people of other faiths. We fear being seen as foolish. We fear losing family or friends, maybe even a husband or a wife. So I guess we need to ask ourselves, am I convinced? Am I convinced that Jesus died for all people? Am I convinced that in Jesus all people have died to sin and need to accept God's free gift? Am I convinced that to live in Christ is the very best outcome for every single person on the planet? Am I convinced enough to live out those convictions? And before you wonder, it's just as true about me. I miss more than my fair share of opportunities. I get tons of them and I blunder them and I say the wrong things and I don't say anything at all because I'm tired or scared or whatever. I have just as much fear of telling other people. So I'm not having a go at you. But I do think we need to think about it. So Jesus says, Luke 12, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after the killing of the body, has power to throw you into hell. 
Yes, I tell you, fear him. I know that we get that. It makes perfect sense. It doesn't make talking to people any easier. But it does make sense. Psalm 147 also makes sense. Verse 10, His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of a man. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Instead of fearing God, most often we treat God like he's the owner of a candy shop or a lolly shop. Now that great one that's up in Lura. You go in there, there's, I was going to say thousands, but there's probably tens of thousands of varieties. And God is this uh, sweet old grandpa who wants to give you, his grandchild, everything. So you can, it's got to be grandpa and grandchild because grandparents give the, kids any, give the grandkids anything at all because they can hand it back. So it's got to be the grandpa figure. Uh, and he gives us all the bits and pieces, that anything we want. It doesn't make any difference whether it's good or bad for us. It doesn't make any difference whether it's going to be a fortune that you're going to spend at the dentist for the rest of your life. That doesn't matter. That is not the God that we meet in the Scriptures. See, the God of the Scriptures is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. It took him as much power to do everything that we see in the universe and everything that you and I understand, it took him one single thought. There it is. Of all of the power that God has at disposal, just God said, let there be light. I could say, let there be $10 million. God said, let there be light, which is far more impressive. And there was. Let there be humans. Let there be... That's the sort of God that we're talking about. Not the owner of a candy store, but God who speaks and things happen. Massive, incredible things happen. Awesome things happen. I really I detest the way people use that word, awesome. If you use it, I, I'm not having a go at you either. But, you know, that movie was awesome. That... Uh, huh, that woman, she's awesome. Ooh, there, there you go. Uh, I've heard people say that. Um, yeah, that, that, that song was awesome. That church service was awesome. That chocolate bar was awesome. Uh, that's not awesome. God is awesome. I, I personally like to reserve awesome for God. Though ice cream, possibly. I'm not sure about that. But no, definitely God, though. Uh, because, I mean, God is awesome. He, it's the things He makes, they're awesome too. That's okay. I don't mind that. But we should reserve the one, the, the word, for the one who created the world with just a single word, the blink of an eye, the, the, the merest amount of power at his disposal, who created us in all of our splendour and all of our weaknesses and offered us the opportunity of having a relationship with his son, who sent his son to proclaim victory over sin and death. God is awesome. Nothing else comes even close. See, what if we received from this awesome king of the universe? 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. If we are in Christ, the old, dying, hopeless self, the old, lifeless body is gone. If we are in Christ, we have been replaced by a new person. That is what we have received from the God of the universe. God has reconciled us to himself. Not two friends making up after a little argument they had one afternoon. But God has reconciled. God has offered the terms for peace to his enemies. We should never think that God looked down on us and thought, Oh, those people of Jamboree, they're really lovely. I'll just make them part of the kingdom of God. God looked down on the people of Jamboree before we were his and said, Enemy! Enemy, 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 enemy. 
it's to his enemies that God offered peace. God is willing to not count our sins against us. You know, they, they talk about heaven being out of that balance, you know, whether your good will outweigh your evil, and they've got these great big scales. And I've seen it in churches where they talk about it, put all the good stuff on one and all the bad stuff on another. For Christians, if you are in Christ, then the scales are gone. There is no scales. There's no balancing because the thing doesn't exist in the first place. What is in there in its place is Jesus. And as we come to the judgment seat of Christ, we get this great paid stamp on our forehead and Jesus says, no, nah, this one's mine. Go into heaven. That's what we have from the God of the universe. And finally, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, to bring people from being enemies to being ambassadors. God has made us agents of the King. We report directly to the King, Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.20 We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. <coughs> Excuse me. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we have a ministry of reconciliation, a ministry of bringing people to Christ and displaying Christ to them and speaking about Jesus to them. Not just about bringing people to church, that's a nice idea, but offering people what we have received. That is the ministry of reconciliation. And we do that, Paul says, by living for the things that Jesus died for. Verse 15, he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. This is a, a world of choices, about choosing things that are important, even if it means sometimes you forfeit other things that also feel important. We know that already. If we have chosen to follow Jesus, we already know that this world is about important choices. Because we've already made the most difficult choice of all. Giving up control of our lives, submitting all that control to Jesus. He died so that we might live. But not just live any life. Because really the big choice is not the first one of coming to Jesus. That's hard enough, I guess. The really hard choice is every day choosing to follow Jesus. Of every day giving up that control. He died so that we might not live for ourselves, but so that we might live for Him. We're not given freedom so that we can just go and do our own thing for the next 60 years. We're given freedom so that we can become slaves to Christ. As we make decisions about what we will do, the ministry we will do, the work we will do, the house we live in, the education we offer our kids, the way we deal with our grandkids, the, the way we spend money, the, every decision. As we make those choices, we have to decide based on the fact that God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God. That has to be the deciding factor. As we live for Jesus and not for ourselves, Paul finishes with these in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 6. As God's fellow workers, I urge you, sorry, as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favour I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. Let me pray for us.